Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. America has had a really long history of fine arts and environmental conservation. This boardwalk overlooks uh, freshwater wetlands. It's a cattail marsh. There's hundreds of species here. We always want to know where the end of our firearm or the muzzle is pointed at all times. This is basic safety. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. is a way for us to get people inspired about the outdoors and really to take that inspiration that they have about nature and channel it into some art form. I'm Lisa Resnicek, park interpreter from Galveston Island State Park. Today in Galveston Island State Park, we're excited to have a sandcastle contest Everybody in the entire family can join. You know, if the contest doesn't draw them in, the shade actually might. It's an experience. It's something that I remember when I was a kid and I went to the beach with my family. It was something that we all did. Are you guys building sand castles? Did you know that we're gonna have a contest? I'd love to get you guys involved. It's a way for us to introduce the concept of arts in the parks and three-dimensional art or sculpture. Do you sandcastle at all? You got some good skills? It looks like you guys are already working pretty hard on some sandcastles. I would love for you to join. I also do camera phone hikes, water coloring programs, drawing and journaling programs. All right, I'll so see you soon. just a little bit of what the Texas State Parks can offer in our Arts in the Parks programs. Stemming back from some of the earliest national parks that we've had, America has had a really long history of fine arts and environmental conservation. More than once I've heard adults, kids, and families in general come up to me and say, I had no idea that I could do this outside and now it's just another thing that gets me back outside, gets me back into the Texas State Parks. I've even had a family with young toddlers who now have watercolor sets for the entire family and every time they go camping, they now take out their watercolor sets. Today we are going to do some watercolor painting. I'm Lauren Hartwick and I am I'm the park Lee interpreter Lee. at Lockhart State Park. One of our dry watercolor palettes. For me, it's just a way to relax outside, draw in people. Now you can see right away that the wet on wet technique is going to give you nice blurry lines. I try to give them enough information to get them started. Pretty cool, right? After that, it's all about giving them a chance to express whatever they want to express. Hmm. It allows people to get outside and express their creativity and make observations about nature and try to translate the beauty of nature onto a page. Yeah, cool. What about green? Are you going to do a landscape? Oh, no. I like having Arts in the Parks programs because sometimes it draws a different audience into the park. That is really cool. Ooh, that looks good. I just do black. It's really appealing to families <laughs> and kids or just the young at heart. That's a cherry. Red. Thank you. It helps to have objects to draw sometimes, like an antler or a feather, something you can look at in front of you and translate onto the page. Brown. Some of them were drawing the wildlife that you would find here in the park. I see it! We do painting, we do block printing, uh, we do origami. I need a one. We try to do an art-specific program once a month, once every other month. That's a beautiful painting. Yeah. Lots of inspiration to be had. <laughs> You'll enjoy your camping, too. Okay, thank you. Sure thing. See you guys, enjoy your stay. You're good to go. My name is Zach Riggs. Oh yeah, I am the park interpreter here at Dinosaur Valley State Park. 
Everyone comes down here and heads straight for the dinosaur tracks. We just got finished with archery out here. We've got the hiking and biking. We've got horse riding here. Not every park gets to claim that. Later on tonight, we're gonna do a nature photography class. I've taken these pictures with my phone, which is an iPhone 8. If you've got any questions about these before we go, just let me know. I am going to lead a nature photography hike, which is utilizing smartphones primarily because everybody has smartphones with them all the time. Most of the time we see something pretty and we just take a quick picture of it. We don't really think about exactly where it is in the photograph or think about the colors. Casey is a great photographer. So Casey is one of our volunteers here at the park. She's helped me out with so many different programs and this nature photography hike was actually her idea. We're gonna walk about two miles. I think a lot of people aren't really used to exactly what all the phones can do. Is that an Android? Okay, good. Never done this before. Oh yeah, that looks good. That looks great. I used to carry a camera around all the time, years ago, wherever I went, because I never knew what was going to strike me as beautiful. But these smartphones, they're fantastic, and it's nice to have it with you. That spot right there is one of my favorite spots, where the river curls right there. We're going to visit a part of the river that's not normally seen. It doesn't even look like Texas. People don't go down that way that much. That's why I like it, too. I'm not saying don't look at the dinosaur tracks, but don't just look at the dinosaur tracks. They've got great hiking trails, and there's so much more to see. I just think it's all about where you look and how you look. If you're looking for little pieces of beauty, you'll find them. We're surrounded by concrete all the time, you know, and people are always on their phones. We're gonna go around this way. But if they're using them to capture something beautiful and get out of nature, uh, it can maybe spur them to go out and find different things outside that they would enjoy. like a ditch or a moat or like a little bitty river. If you want to make a mermaid out of sand, that's totally fine. You can be as creative as you want. Think big. Once people get their hands in the sand, they don't want to stop. That's looking really good. I think that part of the experience of joining the Sand Castle Contest is just building, being with friends, being with family, being in a beautiful setting. I think it's fun just to participate. Lots of fun, all, all the kids on the beach coming together like this, it's, it's fun. Looks good. Nice. Oh, it's like a pond. Oh, that's gonna be great. Five minutes. The rain is coming. Even castles made out of sand fall into the sea. Eventually. <laughs> it was really nice. You were inspired by the beach. I love it. It's nice. Make sure it doesn't run out. We do give out prizes to help inspire people. The most creative castle for the day. Nice job. So a lot of pencils, stickers, temporary tattoos for all of our participants. Best volcano. You guys get the best teamwork, you work so well. We're only gonna cover just about this much of 2,000 acres. We start with sand castles, but we're hoping people continue to go out and explore and continue to be inspired by nature. It's a soft opening here at the Leona Bell Turnbull Birding Center. So this boardwalk is the first step in uh, rebuilding of an entire system. Well, magnificent frigate bird, occasionally on southeast Gulf and west coast. That's a big, big bird. Colleen Simpson's pretty proud of this unique birding destination. This boardwalk overlooks 
a freshwater wetland. It's a cattail marsh. We've got American alligators, common gallinule, great blue heron, roseate spoonbill. There's hundreds of species here. Oh, oh, look right here, look right here. Right in front of us. Oh, you are gorgeous. Oh, beautiful. This is the old boardwalk. And it got hammered. In 2017, Hurricane Harvey hit Port Aransas and tore through the birding center. Now, work is underway to rebuild. It's 1,280 acres of uh, tidal flats and salt marsh. That's all protected under the umbrella of the nature preserve. So eventually, we'll have a system of three to five miles of trail and boardwalk throughout the entire preserve system. Hi there, welcome. Thank you. Enjoy the walk. Thank you. So yeah, we've only been open for about a month, well, so yeah, it's we're good really timing. Excited to see that. Yeah. <laughs> you see that little white and black bird that looks like he's wearing a tuxedo? It's called a black neck stilt. You know what? You know what that is? Which one? The, the, red. the one with the red beak? Yeah, so this boardwalk definitely opens a door to a perspective that we don't usually see. So you get to really get an up, a closer look to how the animals interact here. The alligator, look, 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 oh my god. Wait, is it growling at us? That's so cool. Right now he's shaky. There's bubbles all around him and it looks like the ground's moving. So exciting to see that. <laughs> oh my god, that's so unreal. <laughs> you know, the alligator growls or the birds chirp or they see the, the baby birds with their mom. It's unbelievable to see because you hear about those kinds of things happening, but you don't get to see them five feet from your face. It's really, it's very cool. <laughs> Like he's after something. He's going fishing. Wow. Something that's inspiring is the resiliency of our ecosystems here. It's all coming back. And we'll return to how things were before the storm. Hi, I'm Heidi Rayo, Hunter Education Specialist with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Let's talk about safe firearm muzzle control. We always want to know where the end of our firearm, or the muzzle, is pointed at all times. This is basic safety, but it's amazing how easy it is to forget where it is pointed. If you're hunting alone, you still need to be very aware of where your firearm's muzzle is pointed. There could be other hunters or even a building near where you're hunting and you never want your firearm pointed at anything other than your intended target. Always make sure your firearm is on safety. You always want to keep your finger outside of the trigger guard until you're ready to shoot. Always keep your muzzle pointed in a safe direction. Your safe direction can change with every step you take. This is important in case of an accidental misfire. When you're hunting with two or more hunters, you need to be aware of where the other hunters are at all times. You really must talk and let the others know where you are. And how you carry your gun is very important. You always want to carry your gun in a way so there's no possibility for the muzzle to be pointed at any other hunter. One of the safest ways to carry your firearm is known as the two-handed carry or the ready position. This carry also provides the most control over your firearm and it gives you a quick setup for a shot. Firearm safety is your responsibility. Always know where your muzzle is pointed, keep your safety on, and keep your finger outside of the trigger guard until you're ready to shoot. By following these basic rules, you can have a safe, fun, enjoyable hunting trip.
These researchers are trying to solve a puzzle. It's going to be up on the side of the hill, Sean. I told you. In a coyote den. They are looking for a missing pronghorn antelope. Pretty close now. There it is. All that's left of this particular animal is a radio tracking collar. Well, I think it's uh, probably predation. Because we don't have any body on this collar, we can't determine anything other than it's, it's gone. But this much is known. Pronghorn antelope are fading away suddenly in a place they were once abundant. There's nothing more unique to West Texas than the pronghorn antelope. Until four or five years ago, they were just part of the landscape. We've just seen a, a, a huge decline. When we lose the pronghorn, we lose a little bit of us. And we've got to figure it out here pretty quick before it's too late. Above the fields of the Texas Panhandle, a helicopter hauls some unusual cargo. These pronghorn are being transported from far north Texas to supplement populations in west Texas. You used to be able to drive from Ballantyne to Marfa and maybe see two or three hundred of them just from the highway. And now you're lucky if you see one. To help the dwindling herds around Marfa, Texas Parks and Wildlife is transporting some 200 pronghorn from the northern panhandle. Pronghorn are the fastest land mammals in North America, so catching them is not easy. After a nine hour drive, the pronghorn take their first steps into their new home. I'm just, hang on, I just want to check on this one here. Billy, you want to take a look in? Biologists will monitor the new arrivals and study their fawns born in the spring. We're hopeful that they will prosper and do well. The best feeling is going to be when they start making babies and when these populations come back to what they used to be. The population began to crash in 2008. Five dead here, four dead there. And we blamed a lot of that on the drought, but we began to get rains and watch the antelope continue to decline, and then we knew we had a problem. To unravel the mystery, Professor Lewis Harvison and his wildlife management students began to investigate causes of mortality. We started sampling some of the pronghorn, and one of the first clues that we found from those necropsies was the homuncus. This common pronghorn parasite was being found in alarming numbers. If you have thousands of these worms in your stomach, then obviously you, you become anemic, you're weakened, uh, you're not going to evade uh, predators and cold spells and heat spells like, like you would if, if you were a more healthy animal. The stomach worms may be just one prong of the pronghorn problem, but initial findings make way for further study. Are you picking up this one right here? Is that one from over here? Yeah. How many were predator related? So far? Yeah. Five, we contributed to some type of predation. By summer, Marfa has not been very welcoming to those relocated pronghorn. There's not a lot out there for pronghorn to eat, so it's just pretty rough on them right now. It's going down on the record as one of the worst droughts that we've experienced. And drought has not been the only challenge. We've had several huge fires in the Trans-Pecos region. A lot of livestock have been lost, a lot of fences have been lost, hundreds of thousands of acres. But in the end, if there is a silver lining, it is that those rangelands actually will come back in healthier condition if and when we ever get rainfall. What little rain has fallen has heightened another threat. Runoff has greened up the roadsides, making these perilous places all too tempting to wildlife. Within the last few weeks, we've had several vehicle collisions. And there may be other connections to the drought. It's pretty dry. They don't have a lot to choose from. You know, they're, they're going all day long. Without enough weeds and forbs, Poor nutrition could be a piece of the puzzle. 
they have to expend a lot of energy to come find one piece to do any good. And they could be filling up on some sort of vegetation, but they're not really getting what they need to survive. Pronghorn survival here ultimately depends on the health of their offspring. So fawn mortality is the focus of graduate student James Weaver's research. We've been experiencing some extremely low fawn crops throughout the region. And so I'm out here trying to figure out why. It's really good if you can spot a doe right before dark and see the fawn up and watch it till it beds down. Finding the fawn is the hard thing. And that's the only fawn that's still around, so I think that they just have fawned and perished. Yeah. The researchers watch the herd until sundown in hopes they can locate fawns after dark. Armed with spotlights, they scan for eyes on the horizon. You see something? Our population is pretty sparse, so we spend a lot of time just searching. Yeah, those big eyes there. Just keep going like this, and we'll go right back down. Sometimes we come across them pretty quick. Other nights we've spent several hours out here and not caught a thing. There he is. Oh. The fawns may be young, but they're already fast. Got him, got him, oh, how'd we miss it? These are very labor-intensive research projects. Ah, uh, he won this battle. The crew gives up the chase for the first fawn, but for the rest of the night, the captures go smoothly. Catch James. Oh. Nice snag, dude. That worked. It did work. Oh. We got one. Oh. That's a big one, too. Oh. Okay, okay, baby. Okay. The main I thing is the weight. Too. The weight's really a, a strong correlation to survival. Oh. Nope, nope, nope. Oh. So the heavier okay. the animals are at birth, the more likely they are to survive. Nine pounds. Okay. Nine. Where's the clipboard? We measure them from the nose to the tail head. Seven. Look at new hoof growth. Damn present. Yes. We put ear tags in the animal, and then we also collar it. All right. We had some success. It was a good night. We've had some really hard nights so far. This, this was a pretty good night. The fawn seems dazed at first. But as the crew packs up, it is off and running again. Hopefully, onto a long life as an adult pronghorn. You did good, except that one catch and release. That was. <laughs> well, it's gonna be early now. We're gonna be home by three. What am I gonna do till five in the morning? <laughs> We've got a great team working on this, so uh, I'm very hopeful that we'll find answers. As research into the plight of the pronghorn builds, close. so does support for this West Texas icon. It keeps you going to know that you're helping the species out. It's definitely a joint effort. In the midst of a drought, optimism's hard to embrace, but I think we have the right team together. Everyone wants to know what's going on with the pronghorn, and so I know with that kind of support from the community, we can turn this around. You can help support Texas Parks and Wildlife's big game conservation efforts through the Bighorn Sheep and White-Tailed Deer Conservation License Plate Program. Over $1.2 million has been generated from the sale of these plates, funding projects like chronic wasting disease research and containment, population and harvest surveys, and Bighorn Sheep and Pronghorn restoration efforts. Every plate on a car, truck, or trailer means more money for big game in Texas.